Dick Beam's coming in. As I wanted to uh, share the screen of Mike's presentation last night there. Is anybody... Where was this that held? Mike uh, held it up at his, uh, where, where is it, Mike? Where is this being held? Uh, this is in the palatial uh, river room of the Delta Club in Trilogy in Rio Vista. Okay. So you you kind of liked it? Uh, it was interesting? Oh, it's a neat, neat to cover the history of astronomers and the where they were in history and what was going on. That's kind of neat yep. to, to have an idea what was going on. Yeah. Is that a PDF file that you've made big, or how do, how do we go look at it now? That's a projection on the TV taken with my uh, uh, wise uh, camera that was converted into a webcam. <laughs> so, Mike, could you uh, send a copy of that screen to us in high resolution? I could put it up now if you want me to. Um, one way. I think it's kind of neat where you it's, show where all the uh, various astronomers were and how they overlap each other. Get got to well, see the resolution. It's hard to read the names. Here, let me uh, let me. Uh, you um, can actually um, you can actually do a chat and attach a file that way too. I think. Okay, I, ha I it's a um, it's a PowerPoint presentation. Can you uh, do that? I don't know how big that would be. Yeah, you'd want to extract that one screen somehow. Okay, let me see if I can do that. You don't have to do it right now. Maybe at some point, it'd be kind of cool to have a copy of that in high resolution. Okay. Put it in the newsletter or in the, yeah, or on the okay. website. Yeah, at least something like that. Well, you could put under the, you know, the, uh, the page that's got the various members that are astronomers and their, you know, their creations. I think this is a um, a JPEG. So let me just go send it to you. Oh, cool. Dick, how you doing? Oh, good. Better. <laughs> good. Yeah, my back has been bugging me. Just doing uh -huh. a little gardening and, and it tweaks out. I'm going under the knife. Don't know Ooh. when though. Yeah. Right. Found that your back brace that works so well. Yeah, I got a back brace that that's helping an awful lot. Otherwise, I'd be really uh, pretty much out of it. I was yeah, kind of yeah. going way downhill, and then I got this brace, and uh, so I've been able to do some things, and uh, I'm getting somewhere on the observatory. So you so you're saying you have an exoskeleton right now? <laughs> yes, basically. Yeah. So do you do you do a lot of resting? I was doing an awful lot of resting before I got the brace because I'd go out and do something and, and, and I, it's taking days just to get you know to the point where I felt like I could do anything. This brace, what it does is it, it pushes down on the hips and it pushes up on the rib cage. So, so it, it takes pushes, a load off the-, the, the Yeah, uh, it spreads that out. Line. Yeah. Now, when I went in to see the specialist, you can take the MRI and slide down a cross section of the spine. You can see there's a, a white space in the middle of the spine column, and that represents uh, the uh, nerve, the area where the nerve bundle goes through. It actually represents the additional space in there. Okay, that's there is the hardly height. any. When it gets down to this point right there, there yeah. is none. As a matter of fact, it looks to me like there's evidence of crimping. So he said, what his, uh, his thing is, is uh, uh, they do what they call a laminotomy. And the laminectomy, they take the whole thing off. Yeah, they cut the bones and then they- Yeah, they cut it. the whole top off. This, they cut both sides off. Well, the problem with that is, is that you're weakening the bone, see? Now, you do a microdiscectomy they, too. They put in a device, it's called the coflex. And this coflex, what it is, think of it as a U bracket with cleavages on it 
such that it pins itself into the vertebrae there. And it maintains uh, spacing and it has it can spring open and so forth, see. And then also you can twist from side to side because it's not pinned. It's it's put in there with these cleats. Um, and so that device will give you full range of motion from what I've heard. And uh, so uh, that's the direction I'm heading in right now is to get that done with the laminotomy and uh and and get my life back <laughs> so to speak. i told you about my herniated disc did i not <laughs> yeah i don't have a herniated disc i just oh. have uh what i have is a spacing issue there with between the l4 and the l5 vertebrae on the lower lumbar part of the spine okay with them being this is kind of more like a hereditary thing and so as you get older you start to get the, it starts to compress in that region and the problem uh, gets worse and worse as, as that happens. So what this does with this Coflex device is it maintains that spacing and keeps it for once they've did the surgery and open it up, then uh, it's a done deal. And I guess the only problem they've had with it is they can't get anybody to come back and tell them how well it worked out because <laughs> I guess they just take off and they never come back. Uh, oh, this good. guy's been doing them for about five years. Uh, Dr. Carr has. There's only about two surgeons that I know of that do them on the Central Coast. Now, of course, down where you guys are at, there's probably a little bit more to deal. You know, you probably. I could do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might not like the results, though. <laughs> yeah, we just made sure one, you're of, exactly one of the right. other. One of the other surgeries they do is if you have compression, they actually go in with a burr. And you know, with a, a microdiscectomy, and go in and remove the bone in the area that's pushing on the nerve. Yeah, yeah, that's and that's kind of what this laminotomy. They're going to be taking it out of both sides, but they leave. Oh, so the they're bone. going to remove bone then. They they don't they don't remove the bone. They just they just shave both sides on each huh. side of it, and then they put this device in there to maintain the spacing and keep it from compressing more with time. Because if you've got to figure, if you're taking bone mass out, it's going to weaken it. There's just no getting around it. So what this device does is it maintains that spacing. And over time, it shouldn't weaken. It's titanium is what it's made out of. As all oh, okay. Implants are usually made out of that kind of stuff. So it's, it's going to last more than longer than me anyway. <laughs> all right. So has anybody got something they want to get across tonight at the telescope workshop? We're going to any problems to discuss? Any uh, anything you've been working on? Well, I sent the uh, laser pointer holder uh, thing, but uh, I, actually everybody up here has already received that email. So everybody's seen this. Yeah, I saw it right now. Thank you for the information. What really impressed me is that it was like two dollars and ninety five cents plus tax. It's eBay. all aluminum. Yeah, that's pretty. It's, it looks it looks like a laser with a silencer on it. <laughs> well, that's the ring I made that uh, pushes on the button, so you can have constant on if you uh -huh. want. Well, this is your extension too that you for that you put right, on right. to so the beam wouldn't spread too far. Well, yeah, the, I've had, I've said that before. The uh, there's a lot of spurious or uh, spurious radiation, a big circle of, of radiation. Uh, but I measured the power in it. It's only 500 microwatts. It's not, it, it's ice safe. It is not a, but it's also very disconcerting to people that get it in their eye. They think, like Mike Ferris said, you're just showing your laser in my eye. I was shining it way above his head and I pointed out to him what he was seeing and what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that didn't do any good. Uh, so uh, that tube is just a piece of uh, white uh, PVC pipe. And you heat the end of it and so it's soft and you push it over the end of the laser so it expands. And then you spray the inside with uh, flat black paint. And then I, uh, I think I use sand. I could use either sand or sawdust. And you put that in there while the paint is still wet. You roll it all around and you got to stick to the paint. And then you spray more flat black paint in there. So the thing is really diffuse. And the, uh, you don't get that, that uh, 
big ring. The only thing you see is the laser beam going out. So Bruce, I want to ask you again, the, this USB charging point port, how, how long of a charge do you get out of the laser? Weeks. Really? I so, mean, oh yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, I mean, they don't get turned on that much. They get turned on. Yeah. I use these for the original alignment, initial alignment. And then if we're at a star party uh, and somebody wants to know where we're looking, I just go and turn the laser on and point right in the sky where you're looking. And with our light pollution, you know, you can't see anything there. You just see milk colored sky, but you say, that's where we're looking. So it gives people an orientation as to where they are in the night sky. You know, I always had a problem with these thin lasers at the, I don't know, it was, it used to be like one or two double, triple A batteries inside. No, seemed like this has a, has a, 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 a rechargeable battery in it. Is it a 3.7? It's, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's not, not lithium removable. ion? It's a lithium ion. It's not removable. It's internal. There but is no, lithium? see the ones that you have, you'll see there's a silver ring in the middle of the tube. Okay and it unscrews there and that's how you uh, get in you know you can change the batteries right yeah this one has it has no 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 ring in the middle and the so end lithium doesn't come I, off isn't there something about the laser needs a minimum of three volts so if you use double a triple a batteries you you're lucky to get three volts and then if it falls below that your laser falls off quickly or if it's lithium ion you've got 3.7 or four to work right with. is that right. Yeah, and they also have a uh, DC DC converter in there, so they're actually regulating the current into the uh, into the uh, laser diode. So it uh, it stays constant brightness until the battery gets dead, then it just goes out. There's none none of this diminishing. Now on the other one that's that's on the right there, that's the one that's got the picker laser in it. That's on the C11, and you can see the uh, green tape in the middle there. Yeah, right there. Mm -hmm. That's a heater. That's a 29 ohm heater. Huh. And it's right around where the uh, laser diode is. So it warms it. Because I was having trouble with this. You know, you go to a star party and it's cold. And all of a sudden, the light coming out of this thing just as, you know, peters out, goes away. It doesn't go out entirely, but it's very weak. So um, that plugs into a cable that goes down to my master distribution box and uh, keeps that nice and toasty warm. Very cool. I think that has to do with the uh, uh, the uh, cavity, resonant cavity. Has you know, has to be a certain length for it to work properly. Okay. I, I once went to the optical fiber conference, and they were giving away a bunch of free lasers, and I found out the reason why. I grabbed a whole handful. They wouldn't work at room temperature, but when I used some free spray on it, oh boy, they just lit up the whole room so uh they were obviously rejects so well it's a, it's a double whammy the uh it's temperature co uh, temperature coefficients on both the batteries and the laser laser diodes have a negative temperature coefficient all diodes have a negative temperature coefficient so as the temperature goes down the forward voltage on them goes up but the di the batteries as the temperature goes down the voltage goes down so there becomes a point where the batteries just don't have enough voltage to support the uh, the laser, and it sort of peters out. There may be the secondary thing that you're talking about, they're changing the resonance too, the resonant cavity. Oh, but putting that uh, heater on there, I put that on there, gee, I don't know, four or five years ago now, and uh, that just absolutely solved the problem. I carry a fairly large battery with me. My telescope, this C11, draws 3.6 amperes out of the battery when it's working. All the heaters that I have, I have five different heaters, and uh, the, the the mount itself draws about 600 milliamperes. Okay, so you should attract cats while you're out there. Say what? You should attract cats while you're out there all that <laughs> and if it's a powerful one mount mines <laughs> oh i bought three lasers i bought it was a three pack for for 1595 the same kind of laser as these uh you know rechargeable one red one green one violet and so i bought two of them two packs so i have 
two different places. Anyway, it, it was an interesting study because I went out last night or the night before last. Anyway, showing them in the night sky, and I uh, it was a struggle to see the red laser. The green laser was obviously the brightest because that's where our eyes are the most sensitive, and the violet laser was not far behind. Yeah. Oh, this is this is a AAA battery one here. Yeah. See, that's got that, that ring in the middle. Yeah. That's where they come apart. Well, th this one is is the big big lasers, the big heavy heavy lasers. So your rechargeable one is somewhere. Uh, I, I sent you the link to that. Um, yeah. I've got by the way, I haven't there. noticed much difference in brightness between the big laser and these smaller lasers. And they seem to last about the same. Well, the big laser is uh, you have to put batteries in it. They're uh, uh, lithium ion and rechargeable, but they don't recharge in the, the laser. You have to put them into a holder to recharge them. It's the same so batteries you, my flashlight uses. Ed, are you doing OK? Yeah. Good. I got in. Hi, Ed. Hi. Hello, Ed. So, Tom, I sent the uh, email again with the uh, the oh, with the detail. Good. Let's see if I can. This time with feeling. <laughs> 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 so, so that's an. That looks pretty small. That chart. Let me see. How can I save that image? I could just share it. Uh right now for everybody to see and then you could uh yeah, yeah go ahead see okay uh speaking of lasers does anyone have a uh red light at night for when you're observing yes i have one that hangs under my scope it's not a laser it's just a red led yeah it illuminates my it? accessory tray where'd you get it i made it it's a whole bunch of surface mount LEDs on a little printed circuit card with a 100 ohm resistor to limit the current, and it runs off 12 volts. What is this chart we're looking at? I gave a I gave a talk last night to the Windy Skies Observers on uh, a basically graphical, where I came up with a graphical representation of the history of astronomers, how they related to um, warfare in uh, epidemics, what they had to go and oh. uh, face during their careers. And so um, it all started when I, I read a book uh, from Stephenson called Quicksilver, which was placed when uh, scientists in the time of the London uh, epidemic, uh, uh, the bubonic plague. Yeah, Mike, I, Mike, I'm going to share the one you sent me because it's clear. So I'm going to stop your share and put the, the photo you sent me. OK. I think Le Gentil takes the cake for uh, adventures. So you got wars and pandemics on there, huh? Right. But, but another thing, too, is that this really shows you um, that you know when you read history books about these people, you don't, they don't tend to um, emphasize that these people actually knew each other and, and uh, did things with each other. Like, I forget which, um, which British astronomer went and visited Galileo, Galileo when he was under house arrest and said, you got to write that book you've been talking about. Okay. And so he, uh, Galileo wrote his, his final book and um, somebody from the Netherlands came and visited him and smuggled out the uh, manuscript and because it was a banned, without even looking, it was a banned book. And, uh, but when you, when you look at this, the, 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 I, I purposely made this a smaller history than you know, it could have gone back 2000 years before this and up to the present day. But this is, you know, during this period, um, astronomers really faced some tough times. Um, you know, you got Copernicus there in the beginning and he had the 
the good uh, the good sense to die before the Inquisition there, and uh, Bruno didn't. Okay, and he got burned at the stake. Um, so it, it, his life ends as sixteen hundred, and not by disease, but by re religious fervor. You know, sort of like the human barbecue. Um, but what did he discover? I've never I've never seen well, that name he was, before. Um, he didn't discover anything. He read Copernicus and uh -huh. preached the uh, sun centric uh, universe. Oh yeah. Okay, and that was blasphemous. And his big, his big no-no was saying that, you know, there's probably life just like us and all those other stars. Yeah, yeah. But you see, but Tycho Brahe would have known him, Jonas Kepler, and Galileo, they, you know, they probably all uh, knew of his fate. And I know Galileo, you know, you read some of his books, he, he, he okay. definitely knew Giordano yeah. and uh -huh. uh, had to be real careful about it, but he wasn't careful enough. Well, they put him yeah. under house arrest, didn't they? At they the sort of did, yeah. Well, they, yeah. yeah. But, but the yeah. Um, the yeah. Tycho Brahe, he uh, he was a pre-optical um, astronomer. Yes. He did everything with a quadrant from right. the observatory he had, and his data was so accurate and so well um, kept, or what is it, um, stored or displayed, that everybody after that used his stuff. And you know why? Because he developed the technique of um, statistical, uh, reducing statistical variations by um, taking the averages. That's how he came up with his. Uh, mm -hmm. In another timeline that I um, came across today on mathematicals, um, he's, um, he's credited with um, several instances of uh, taking raw data and making it more accurate by working on it mathematically. But when, when you go take a look at this here, you know, um, you know, you got Brahe, you got Jonas Kepler, okay. And during their lives, uh, the, the light green one is the influenza epidemics and the yellow ones are the plague. And, um, what I didn't show here, like, was with Kepler, he had smallpox, and his eyesight was ruined because of that. And, uh, but you can see that a lot of them had to worry about getting the plague. You know, they didn't know exactly where it came from. Um, they certainly didn't have a means of, of uh, treating. Well, Isaac Newton had a, an expansive um, estate out of town. Yeah, because he was uh, chancellor of the exchequer in England, right. and he would retreat to that and hole up in there and write his books while the plague was raging back in London. Right, and 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 a bunch of these others, you know, they you got to remember that people just didn't stop traveling amongst themselves. You still had free trade. You still had the, you know imports exports, and you and you certainly had wars, okay, where people fought each other, okay. Um, uh, you notice that there's two wars of the Dutch, you know, and, uh, and you go. That's almost a hundred year war. Yeah. I think that's what it was called. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah. Okay. But then you go to the French revolution down, um, in the late 1700s, the French Re revolution, you know, the, the, the time of terror and the Napoleonic wars. And you notice that, um, um, uh, you know, Messier and uh, uh, Laplace and, uh, and Lorange, okay, they all survived it because um, they were apolitical. And two, like Messier, um, he was sort of like part of the uh, space race during that time. You know, there was, there was there's this big competition among all these nations of who had the best, best mathematicians, who had the best astronomers, prizes were given out. That's what Messier lived for, right? Um, the Bernoulli brothers, you know, they had a falling out, you know, um, they had three generations. They had a falling out because one, uh, the father had to go and share a prize with the son. And so um, there was a lot of patronage in prizes and prestige 
with these people. So they survived. Other people like uh, Lavoisier, I think it is, uh, the one who did chemistry, he died because he was a tax man. So uh, uh, Laplace, I, took his, Laplace took his life in his hands when he uh, met with Napoleon. Oh, okay. Was by Napoleon's else? invitation. And he, was so, he, exclu- he talked that, about the uh, universe, but he left God out of it. And Napoleon was a born again Christian. Mm. Very tricky. Well, there you go. Really, I didn't show religion, you know, or, you know, you know, certainly during the, in, in England, you had the Puritans taking control and, um, uh, and causing um, major problems for the scientists, just like um, the Catholic Church did. Um, and in Spain, you know, the uh, Inquisition, 1492, um, Columbus sailed the blue and a bunch of people got, uh, uh, were, were killed because of the religious and for scientific things because they were all, you know, had a, you know, uh, earth centric uh, uh, way of looking at things. <clears throat> but, you know, you, you, you take a look, there's been wars all along and there's still been communications amongst the, uh, the scientists. But to, to, to tell you that these plagues, what these plagues were, you know, you hear about the plague um, and you don't realize in some cases it was only a thousand people or so. In other cases, it was a million people. And what I didn't show here was um, the plagues that happened like in Iran where like over a million people died or in uh, South America or North America where you had the various uh, plagues from smallpox and um, influenza and, and other things that literally wiped um, the continent clean of people. And in Africa, too. Um, well, they didn't have that many people to start with. No. In Africa, millions of people died because of illness uh, caused by uh, traders from Europe um, visiting ports and getting people infected. Well, Columbus brought syphilis to the New World. Yeah. No, no, he brought syphilis from the New World to Europe. That oh, was okay. the only, that was the only reverse thing. Really? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I thought it was the other way around. Okay. No, no, um, but uh, but anyways, you know this this graph shows you know a lot of people you know were contemporaries and they communicated each other. You know, you have Newton that uh, communicated with Leibniz. I don't show that here. There's just too many people to show. And what would have been an interesting thing like Jerry brought up, there's a period before telescopes and a period after telescopes. And it's kind of interesting to note that um, uh, in India, they built this grand observatory well after telescopes were invented. Um, um, that used like, you know, you know, it was, it was like the median dials and whatever they call the, the instruments, uh, the sun dials and all that. So anyway. Well, if you've ever been to the Greenwich Observatory, they've got a giant, uh, uh, it's not theodolite, but whatever you call it, section. It's just on display there, but it was one of the ones that they used a long time ago. I think those were called quadrants. Yeah, quadrants, quadrants yeah. right, quadrants, yeah. right. Yeah, um, in, in India, there's one that's like two or three stories high, and it's it's like a big amusement park, but it's just, you know, there's a gigantic Amarillis, um sphere and um, various other instruments made out of stone. They still exist today, but, you know, back when they were built, they were considered uh, a state-of-the-art for those for those people. But anyways, um, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, it is um, interesting. Um, I'm going to add layers to it. What it doesn't show is sort of like the periods and the instruments and the, yeah, there you go, right there. Yeah, it doesn't, your chart doesn't show the uh, Spanish flu in 1918 either. No, um, I, I kind of cut it off. Okay. Yeah, that was like, uh, that was two times that it is either 50 million or 100 million people died. 
I, I uh, my wife's, some of my wife's relatives uh, died in that, and it doesn't show other epidemics. I've got, if you go Google epidemics and get the Wikipedia page, you get like, it depended upon how you format it, um, close to 40 pages of all the epidemics from, they're talking from like mm -hmm. 2000 years ago before a BC up to now. And it's just truly amazing the number of people that have passed away because of illness of one, one sort or well, another. You know, you're, we think, uh, we think you're, uh, your graph bad, shows you know. a very interesting uh, feature that the, all of the named scientists on there have long lives. They live to be what, in their seventies generally. Or the average age back then was like 35. You didn't live that long. Yeah, but the average age back then the death, uh, for survival was heavily skewed by infant birth, infant deaths. Once you made it past five to 10 years old, you pretty much were guaranteed a, a long life. Like right. We, so almost like we have now. Lots of kids. And I uh, hope some of them survived. Yeah. And, and a lot of my these dad had nine were, brothers and sisters. A lot of these people were rich or were, you know, upper, upper class, so to speak. They didn't have to deal uh, with, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, with the my, dad public. Used, my dad used to claim that children were more of a byproduct. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Children are the uh, investment that never pays off. <laughs> <laughs> you just start waiting long enough. Well, you know, you have to worry about heredity because if your parents didn't have any children, chances are you won't either. I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so raise your hand if you have something to say. Go yeah. ahead, Tom. You raise your hand. Yeah. I did. I yeah, did. Okay. Okay. Uh, I've been working on the observatory, and I'll try and show you where. Let's see if I can, uh, I got to get over here so I can share the screen here. And this, let's see here. This is kind of where I started with this thing. Now, what happened here was the, okay, what I got here, you can see the supports. These are the vertical supports. What I've done is I've taken the top ring and I've, clamped it to the bottom ring. The bottom ring is this welded piece. It's kind of like a welded angle. And the reason why I did that, well, a couple things happened was I left this door opening 36 and a quarter is what they said they wanted. And uh, that's what I did. And so then I took the door out and I measured the door and it turned out to be 38. So that required me to relay the entire freaking thing out with the anchors and everything. So it was a pain in the butt. After that, I didn't trust anything. Any, any dimension, they said, no, I'm going to take it out and try, try it out. So anyway, this is readjusted. I clamped these two together because this top ring has holes in it already. And so then I could translate the holes from that into the base ring to keep these supports just right for, for doing dealing with that right there. So then basically after that got done, then the next Dick, thing- what, Dick, Dick, what was the company of your observatory again? Exploradome, uh, Polydome is another name they call them. But anyway, this is basically everything pretty much as caulked as I want to get it. I ran a so, the outside. Let me ask a question. Yo. Did you have did you have bolts pre-installed in the concrete when it was wet to hold the ring down, or did you no, I just used anchors and just used Hang, okay. the hammer. Okay. And I, I use those little uh uh what the tapcon, I think is the name of these guys. Oh, I the think. screws, yeah. I can't remember what uh, size they were, but they're not real buff. I mean, they're not real big, I should say. They're uh -huh. probably plenty buff enough. I, I can show you so you can kind of see what they look like here. Yeah, they're blue, aren't they? Yeah, they're blue. They're blue, yeah. exactly. And your dome is what? The base is 10 feet in diameter? The base is, yeah, 10 feet, 2 inches. As a matter of fact, 
what I did is I used a laser tape measure on the inside of this ring and I just went all the way around with that laser tape measure, taking the quarter inch thickness into play and all that stuff. And, and I, the radius that I came up with turned out to be really freaking close uh, mm -hmm. to what I needed. But what's better to do is to put this, put this top ring, you see this top ring up here, put that down here and clamp the two together. So that way, you know, you got it just right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then these supports and so forth, uh, they just kind of followed from that. Because see, once I had these holes pre-dilled, then I could just put this guy right up here and just run across. Now, you'll notice I got the wheel ring is here and the dome ring is on top. Okay? You can see the brush seal right here. So, so the dome ring is, is already in play. Yeah, and I, I swung it around enough to find out whether I've got any real problems. The only thing I noticed is the wheel brackets sometimes scrape against the dome ring. And that's just an adjustment. See, there's like uh, the brackets are slotted, have slotted holes. So all you have to do is just undo the, the screws a bit and move the, bra move the bracket away from the wall enough. And that was the only thing I noticed. It's not that bad. I'm not going to get into adjusting it now until we put the dome on. That's looking good. Yeah, we're getting there. And I'll show you kind of what I, where I'm at right now. Let's see here. Stop sharing that guy. And let's see if I can do this. I'm not sure if I can do this here. What's the diameter of the dome? If the, the dome base is diameter is eight, eight feet. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at right now. See, I just started putting the siding up right now, and I got about three panels. There are a total of 10 panels that you need to put up to get the entire, this entire thing around here. Now, these guys are a little tricky because what, what happens is they kind of have a tendency to sag on one side. So what you can do, I'm just screwing them in on the bottom, not on the top, per what they say which I think is a good idea because then you can come back and hit the top ones once you get the whole ring around the bottom. And you can kind of, with the way that these things are, you know, they're, they're uh, um, ribbed. So you can kind of, you can kind of like push the top up a little bit and, and, and compensate for any kind of sag that you're getting just by giving it a little bit more slop on top. And that works really good. So you can keep it pretty, pretty close. Is this a live picture of your observatory? It's live right now. I just, yeah. I just had the, had the uh, PTZ cam on that. Guy okay. right How's it for wind up there with this partially built? Oh, man, it was windy today, and it was a pain in the butt. But I had these clamps, and I, I just got a bunch of these things. Uh, and uh, they work out pretty well. These, these little spring clamps, I got them down at Lowe's. Uh -huh. uh, I did. I, that's kind of what I, how I put the thing together. And they came in real handy with this guy right here. And then also, I'll take like a piece of, of like a two by four. And then I've got some of these pavers. And I just kind of put that on there to keep it loose. Because you, in the bottom of these things, you got to put like a little seal around there. And, and the seal is contoured to the ribbing of the panels and so forth. So you have to put that on first. And so the idea is I, I just clamp the top and just let the, the bottom kind of hang freely away from the base ring. And then that way I can put the foam in there. First, it's got a adhesive back type thing on it. So I put that in there. So it's turning out to be uh, not too bad. I, I figured it's going to take me a couple more days. One more day to get all the panels up and another day to finish everything because I got to do the, I got to nail the top ring here i got one more thing to show you and then that's it i'll run i'm running out uh i've shot some stuff with a 24 millimeter but this is with the uh, mp127 is this is uh the rosette unfiltered uh seven minute subs 44 subs uh so single single shot color yeah just a color cam uh 60 Canon 60, but it came out pretty good. Um, yeah, very good. I, yeah, I like the uh, the bow shocks. See the bow shocks? These are bow shocks. Oh, yeah. 
the 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 I looked this up and it and that those bow shocks are traveling at about four kilometers. I think it's four kilometers per, is that right? Four kilometers per second or something like that. So in other words, they're more than hypersonic. Hypersonic is like Mach 5, I think. And so you're talking about some really fast um, uh, stuff going on right there. I'm so, not sure hypersonic applies in the back. That's, that's it. There's no atmosphere. Well, there is sound travel in space. Um, the stuff that I'm reading right now is they're actually using a lot of sound theory and they're actually applying the, the you know, how you would apply the speed of light to the same equations. They're using yeah. the same equations and they're, and they're using the speed of sound. So anytime you have a situation in which you have a low pressure, you got pressure in space, no matter what, whether you believe it or it's not. It's just very low, yeah. It's very low. But if you have a situation where you have low pressure on one side and high pressure on the other side, you're going to get these things called bow shocks. Yeah. And, and these shock waves are, are measured. Usually they measure them uh, in, well, they, they can sometimes measure them speed of sound. But the sound, the way that they propagate is very much, it is, is pretty much based on uh, uh, our theory of sound propagation. That's, that's, what, that's what I've been reading about. Yeah, it's molecular collisions. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Same, same sort of deal. Mm -hmm. I like, what that's I not... like about this image the most is the way the stars came out. I just, you know, I just, I don't know. It just, the different colors and just the way that everything came together. Um, it, it really, I, I liked it. So, so Dick, do you yeah. know the names of all those stars in there? Oh yeah, sure I do. Anytime <laughs> you want to know, you know, just let me know, and I'll, I'll tell you. I'll rattle them all off to you. But I do know that the stars in the middle are very, very hot stars. They're type O and B stars, and they're probably somewhere around uh, fifty thousand K in terms of temperature. So they're very, very hot. You know what's interesting about that image is. It was about a year ago that I joined your group and I had Gary's scope. And that was the first thing that I tried to shoot was uh, the rosette. And that's of course where all these problems came from. So to come around full circle another year later and go back and do it and do it right, you know, it, it just feels like a, a, a sense of accomplishment. That's it. I figured probably the rest of this week uh, to get the roof on and the door on uh, and then the dome is the only thing left. And I, I'm just sitting here, I'm about 120 feet away with the dome right now from where I need to be. And I'm just thinking, you know, how can I get that thing out there? I mean, you know, I've been trying to, can I drag it with a tractor? Can I, I was thinking about making something that was like a trike shaped thing with three pieces of wood and then like put some caster wheels on it and wheel it over there. Now, some of it's going to be on the dirt, but I think the thing probably weighs less than 200 pounds. And, I, and I, if I could wheel it to over to where the observatory is, then I could get about six guys. And the reason why I think it's six is I figure four on the outside and then, you know, then you get it propped up on one side, see, of the, of the dome ring. And then you get a couple of people to go inside and just kind of walk that leading edge over uh, while the other guys are on the outside, mm -hmm. see and then get it over there. And, and when you get it in place, that thing's just gonna, it's gonna kind of fall down in place, see, because you've got the roof overhang on one side, plus you've got an overhang on the dome itself. So it's gonna kind of like sl 
slip down in place. I saw some guys try to do it on two story building, and it kind of did that same thing where it just kind of. Well, they did it with a crane. They, actually, they used uh, a cherry picker, and they put it on the it's bottom cheating. of the cherry picker and did it that way. Did you have a comment you wanted to make? Who's that? You. You had your hand up a while oh, ago. I, I was. I was. If he was done, I wanted to make one point on the the laser uh, things. If you people buy them, notice oh. in the uh, notice in the uh, this one right here, um, which is also in the the. Uh, things that I sent. You'll notice on the back, there's a, this is carbon fiber wrapped around the uh, clip. All the ones that I had, the clips kept coming off of them. You, you know, you spread this apart to put it in your pocket and it just comes off. That's because I guess it's just ornamental. So I wrapped carbon fiber around that with uh, uh, super glue. And uh, so now it can't move and that took care of it. Very good. Well, let me go back to ask um, Dick, a question about, so you're, you're intending to raise the dome up on top of that structure when the dome is complete, it's full, right? Yeah. When, when I get it to the point where the roof is on, yeah, you know, the overhanging area there, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, as far as I know, then you're ready for the dome. Okay. Uh, and, and so the dome ring is on there now. Um, now I don't know. There are there is some ways to connect that dome ring permanently, or you know, so that it it actually the dome won't come off. But a, a lot of people don't do it that way. Yeah, they, you need to do that because of the wind. Yeah, you could but, do it because of the wind, but mo most people don't. If you're going to go with the six guy approach, it, it makes me nervous if that were my dome. I would want to get a crane and lift it up by a single point on the top because other with trying to muscle it up, you're going to bend it. And if you bend it, you'll never bend it back to be the right shape. Well, polycarb is pretty flexible. And the other thing that I would say right now, now I saw these guys move this thing on this thing. And it looked to me that as you look around the rim of the thing, yeah, let me get the video and show you. But it, it, it looked to me that it was actually already kind of a little bit bent. But when it falls, slops down into this thing there, it, you know, you can't really go anywhere. And it kind of conforms to the ring. Yeah, as long as, it's the, as, long as it's the intended shape, it falls together <laughs> right there. Right. When now, you tip it up on end, I worry that it might bend. No, you're not going to tip it up on end. No, no. no well, I thought you were going to have the two guys inside and the four outside tip it up and... Yeah, everything should be pretty much at level at that point, I would think. And and so you got four guys on the outside, and then you got the two guys on the inside just basically guiding that leading edge over. So the dome, yeah. think of the dome as itself, is going to stay pretty much in a horizontal orientation all the way across. I mean, you might have it a little bit slanted, but I mean, uh, I think it could probably do pretty well. Now, when these guys lifted this thing by crane, mm -hmm. they had a triangle of wood, okay, like a little A-frame in there. And that's where the three points that they were putting this thing on. So think about that. You're putting the entire weight of that dome on three points. And that's the, those are the pick points, too. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, I'm just looking at that. I'm going like, well, shoot, if you can get away with that, and it's polycarb is the material, it's pretty flexible stuff. So it has some forgiveness to it. It's not like you're going to move this stuff around and it'll be permanently deformed unless you really start pushing it. On. I guess. I don't. I got to take a biology break. I'll be back in a sec. <laughs> Good way of putting it. Chuck, did you catch that asteroid flying by? No, it was a combination of it was it was dim. It was near the, the nearly full moon and it was moving so friggin fast that even with my maximum integration, it didn't sit on any of the pixels long enough to show up. Wow. So you need to track it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I was I was sitting on the, the field where it was going to pass through and I was hoping to get a, a video of it going through. But 
no such luck. Did it, so you didn't catch any light reflectance from it at all? Well, technically I did, but detectable from the background glow from, from the moon with a little bit of hazy uh, cloud up there, no. <laughs> Mike. Uh, I have some hopeful news. I just got a email from Babbitt and with it was the shipping number for DHL for my uh, replacement parts for my dome. Yay. Evidently uh, the office helped there. He basically said, Eva's no longer working here. There was some confusion. Here is this shipping number now. <laughs> who is who is Babbitt? Babbitt uh, he's the guy that is running Next Dome. He um, he also um, runs a large astronomical. It's sort of like a Woodland Hills camera, but in Quebec. And so uh, this is a this is like an offshoot of his businesses next to him. So did they change any, uh, the way they make that part at all? I have a feeling that I'm getting some of the last of uh, the original dome. They, they've changed the design, yes. <coughs> but I don't Something know what Something didn't it fit, like. is that the problem? Uh, no, the original dome, um, it was flexing and cracking by virtue of the weight, its weight on the wheels of the dome rotation. It wasn't thick enough. So uh, when I get the dome, I'm going to go and probably put fiberglass over those sections where the wheels are. On the outside, it's gonna look like hell, but it's going to not bend and, and break. And then what I'm do, gonna do is put please, pieces of plastic around there so the water doesn't accumulate um, and cause all, all sorts of problems. So hopefully, um, according to him, I should be like mid-February, I'll be getting all my pieces. If you want to make it really stiff, uh, use some polystyrene foam on the outside. Then you lay the fiberglass over that. You don't want polystyrene because that will melt with fiberglass, but uh, polyurethane. Uh, you want some some moment. You want some separation between the two layers. And yeah, that will but make the, it... yeah, but the the thing is, is that I'm um, right there where he's got the the uh, the pointer is where the wheels are, and so uh -huh. I'm just going to build that up. I'll probably put some fiberglass on there with some resin on the outside, and then I'll paint it white to make it look good, and then um, I'll put something over that that'll keep the water from accumulating in there you know some point that i was thin. trying to make is if you if you double the thickness you make it eight times stiffer it goes as a cube i know but, so yeah but i'm going to get what i'm going to get which is uh, 130 thousandths thick uh, plastic and then i'll build it up with something okay. else is that right over the door where that happens no it, it happens uh where the wheels push on the uh, uh where with the wheels it rests on the wheels uh-huh oh so they had a design flaw and they're fixing yeah. it well so. no no they have it not on mine uh the new design is probably been redesigned i'm getting the old design and i'm just going to go and make it sturdier before it breaks Oh, so it's on the dome side. It's, okay, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's where he's got the, uh, the 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 pointer there. That's where the wheels rest. The dome rests on uh, the wheels. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, huh. Does anybody know what happened to Bob Richards' setup? Just to kind of, I don't know if I'm getting off. I'm sorry. He was uh, getting in operation. I, uh, I thought he was starting to take uh, images. Yeah, I think he was. Okay, so it, it would probably be on in a, in a week or sometime. He comes and goes. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, good. good so, to Tom, I sent you yeah. a, a photo of my observatory as of today. Okay. Oh, good. 
you send it to Tom says at Gmail? Yeah, I think so. Let's see, or let's see anything new with Tom T. Get messages. Come on, get some messages. You're probably using that Cox uh, communication stuff, huh? <laughs> like I am. <laughs> so Frontier, see a new postcard from Frontier offering fiber. Yeah, I got for one a today too. They're putting fiber optic up all over the place. Yeah, I got it behind our house. Uh, $70 a month. Well, that's about oh, what Cox cards is. Well, we're, we're, so, we're so dependent on Cox email, I, I, it'd be have, tough to change. Let's see. I don't Jerry's. use Cox email, I use Gmail. I use Cox yeah. for the cable. Even though people say don't use Gmail because it could go away because it's Google, but uh, you know. Uh -huh. Well, with Cox, you can't get uh, email addresses anymore. They've discontinued it. Every, I'm grandfathered in, and you probably are too, Jerry. But yeah, they're, got, if you, you play I've got it new, five you addresses. But sometimes yeah. what they'll do is uh, later on, they'll say, okay, time, we're going to discontinue. You had enough time to change. So, Well, Jerry, I don't see it coming through. Okay. I know uh, I was with West.net, which got gobbled up by Impulse.net. But everything still worked the same, and now they have sold the, just the email, apparently part of their ISP, to some highways in Alabama. And uh, they said, "Oh, you know, it's transiting over today. Actually, the fifteenth uh, should be seamless." And actually, it has been pretty seamless. Although there were occasions uh, in the last couple of days where I'd go and either try to get mail or send mail, and it would get a weird error message. But now it seems to have settled back down. So we'll see if it remains seamless. Um, while you're trying to get the, the uh, picture on there, uh, you should know that um, I discovered there's a type of USB connector that has self-locking nubs on it. I, I actually purchased some from uh, All Electronics on the uh, Type A. You know, the, with the square, they've actually got little um, nubs on the side uh, on the cables made by Elcom, so they won't pull out. So, you know, a lot of us, you know, with all the cameras and stuff on our telescope, we have, uh, you know, a USB hub, and you, there's a tendency for them to slide out. Yes. Yeah. Well, you uh, you can get USB connectors in a circular connector. They've got the squarish thing in, or the rectangular connector in the middle, but it's got a, a round uh, yeah, but threaded uh, but outside. This is, but this is for, for the regular one because like I've got a, a hub on my telescope to take care of my auto guider, my camera, the telescope mount, uh, and I forget what else. And so they have it tendency sometimes to slide out. And these require like four Newtons of force to pull them out. So they're, oh. once you put them in there, they're there. And so LCOM makes these for, the other connectors don't seem to have the same locking mechanism. They're not capable of it, but the type A's are. And so, uh, um, and most of the hubs are, are type A anyways even USB threes. So, uh, and they sell them in different lengths too. So the ideal cable would be A to A, uh, uh, but a lot of cameras are like type, type B or type C. Now, would that be a crossover cable? I guess no, there's only a data pair. There's still, you can cross it over. There, plus uh, minus. I'm actually using an A to A with this uh, wise camera that, uh, that they you make into a webcam. So they call it latching, a uh, latching cable? Yep. And the one I, the one I got at, um, all electronics, uh, they're only like four bucks a piece. 
you know, because they got, you know, somebody bought a bunch and couldn't use them and got rid of them. One of the ways that you can uh, inhibit pulling them out is make the cord a curly cord. Yeah. And you do that by taking a wooden dowel and taking your straight cord, wrapping it around, and then taking a hot air gun and heating it up until you see the uh, plastic on the uh, outer out the sheet the out, outer covering it's just to start to get shiny and then you stop and you leave it alone and let it cool yeah and when you pull the uh, the wood dowel out you got a curly cord huh but in in the case of like my scope i have to snake it through all sorts of places in a straight manner uh, you know it's a it's a it's a bundle about this wide uh -huh. when it goes through my telescope and so i, I don't have that opportunity yeah, but where it finally plugs in, you put uh, a little curly cord of maybe three or four or five, six turns, so you have a little bit of stress relief. Yeah. So we're still waiting for that picture of uh, Jerry's. Yeah, uh, Jerry. Maybe, maybe Jerry, you have like a five-minute delay be between sending or something. It must be. That's called Cox strikes again. Yeah, Cox heard us talking about it. <laughs> And they're going to show me. So I mailed it to myself in the meantime, and it hasn't shown up here for me either. <laughs> How about do a share screen with a photographic? <laughs> Bring it up and share a screen, Jerry. I, it's not on the computer, it's on my phone. Oh, so I have to email well, that's it. why it's taken five minutes. That explains it. <laughs> he probably used up all his gigabytes. He's now down to 150 kilohertz per second. Yeah. <laughs> I was down at 750 kilohertz per second many years ago. And they kept saying it was my problem. They had me buy a new modem, a new router, and blah, blah, blah. And finally, they put a, a tap down the phone pole, and they were able to duplicate the problem on 100% of their equipment. And it turns out that it was an electronic box on the phone pole probably three or four blocks away from me that in the afternoon when it got hot it malfunctioned yeah yeah while, while we're waiting for this um on the um oregon telescope makers uh mailing list there's a guy that has a 60 inch zero door mirror that he's trying to figure out how he's going to go make into a telescope. He wants to make it like f 2.5 or something like that. That's a humongous task he's got there. Well, these guys, you know, you know, half of them make their own, um, you know, meniscus 30 inch mirrors and 40 inch mirrors. Yeah, but know? this is a different thing. He's up in know, the meter band. This is pounds of zero door. Yeah, he's going to need three guys on each side of the mirror to push it and then push it back. Well, unless, you yeah. know, or you, you know, half of them have uh, machines that do it also. Uh, you know, Jerry, uh, I just sent an email to myself, one of my other addresses, and bing, it just came right through. Yeah. On Cox. Okay, well, I'm going to try this again here. Okay. 16.2 inch. Well, that's a thin mirror. Yeah, Some meniscus. Points. Yeah, with a 13 inch mirror, you only need three points of support. Yeah. I'd like to make one one of these days after I get done with my other projects. In your copious spare time? Oh, man. You have no <laughs> idea how many hours I spent on the uh, uh, going through the data and coming up with that uh, diagram. I had to go hand draw those from scratch. That was very impressive, by the way, I thought. Okay. Mine to me just came through, so let me share. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, go ahead, share. Okay, well, you, if you got it, share. I got both. I got I got both of them at the same time. Okay. They're dated th three three minutes apart. <laughs> so I just shut down my email and booted it back up again, and then they all showed up. Oh, oh, that happens to me. Yes, cock strikes again. Yeah. <laughs> now you'll see that I'm not as far along as either of the rest of you.
How is it coming? As far along as what? As far along with the construction. Oh, yeah. oh, 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 okay. We are way, way ahead of me because I haven't even started to build one. <laughs> I don't have the room for it. Are you I've sure? got the are adapter you... plate for the uh, uh, Atlas uh, AZEQ mount too, and I'm going to put my old mount on there because I, I don't have the AP1100 yet. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Okay. So Jerry, were you sharing it already? No, I was waiting for you to share. If you got oh. it. Okay, yeah, I got it. Oh. Let me see. Hang in there. Share screen. Okay. So that it got witness poles up to where the uh, so the neighbors can, we can be sure the neighbors won't have their line of uh, of uh, view blocked by the thing. So this these walls Pay are five me, feet so high. And it's it's going to be a roll off top roof. It's going to be exactly the shape roughly, and the, the top is going to roll off toward the corner of the stone wall. It doesn't look like it, but there's an it's eight feet by eight feet square. There's another eight feet or nine feet back there to take the roll off roof part. And we just Flat yes. Roof. The, What's that? It's a flat roof? No, it's got a very slight gable to it. Yeah. It's going to be a metal roof. Um, some color that doesn't cause blindness when you look when the sun bounces off of it. And we just had the our stone patio finished um, last Friday. It's pretty. And so, yeah, and so we're, do, we're redoing the whole backyard. And we're having uh, their... Today and yesterday, the gardeners are tilling the soil and amending it. They're about to start laying the watering system and the drainage system. And on Monday next week, the framer is going to show up to frame the building. These are electrical um, pipes sticking up in the near corner. Um, one is going. There's three pipes there. One is power, and two are. Um, Cat sets cables, Ethernet. That's good that you got that. Yeah, and then I wish I had done that myself with the Ethernet, but I can I can do it with a wireless bridge. Uh huh. And out here, uh, there's three bolts in the middle for the pedestal to be nailed or screwed down to it. The pedestal is going to be uh, 20 inches high. And then the mount will sit up, and the telescope will be just about two inches below the um, sliding part of the roof when it's in part two position, I think they call it, if I get that right. The telescope will be horizontal? The telescope will be stored horizontal. Yeah. Uh -huh. I see. By the mount, and the counterweights will stick out horizontal the other way. Now, do you have a, is there a pier going down into the ground there? Oh, the, the, this is a, this is a slab that's about four inches thick. And then okay. this is a 10 inch diameter ID sono tube that's down in the ground four feet and it spreads out at the bottom. So it's like an upside down mushroom. Oh, good. And then these, yeah. these three bolts are put in and spaced right with a, um, some a template that the, manufacturer of the pier sent me and we've had this we've had the the pier on here and the mound on here and the tube on so we know that, that all the proportions are going to fit all right so we're looking to have about march 15 um the thing done well as the diameter of the pier that's going to bolt to those three studs 10 inch diameter 10 inch okay, okay. yeah that ought to be nice and stiff. Yes, it's very rigid. Uh, the mount and the pier uh, have a load limit of scope of 250 pounds. <laughs> and I, I think we're going to be about 75 or 80 pounds. That's not, not exclusive included. of the counterweights or including the counterweights? No, that does not include the counterweights. The, okay. If you include the counterweights, the, the system will hold 500 pounds. What mount Jerry, are you Jerry, what does your 18-inch uh, glass weigh? The glass, the mirror itself weighs 35 pounds. 
Mm. It's uh, 1.75 inches thick and 18 inches in diameter. And what mount are you going to use? It's, a, it's an Astrophysics 1600 mount. Oh, the big guy. Okay. Well, the big guy is a 3600 El Capitan. Oh, wow. You got that one. Wow. No, I have the AP 1600. The 1600 the is the 220 pound. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you have some vibration insulation around the perimeter of that circle? Yes, the uh, sono tube um, that we poured it into is still in there. Okay, that's what I got. Yeah, I don't know if that. I, you know, honestly, Chuck, I don't. I, I hope it works, but I really don't know if that okay. is or not. But I figured that what you could do, if you have to, you can get in there and jack out around it you know enough to get it through the pad and then you should have pretty good isolation I would think. yeah well, i think we've we we did it they send a recommended sheet for how to build it and how to support it and we follow the recommendations from uh, advanced telescope system atc so i think we'll be good now we we did a new stone wall back there we did a new stone patio a larger patio lost half of our grass when the telescope is in, in and the uh, roll-off roof observatory is finished, I figure within the first two weeks after that, we're going to have about a magnitude 7.5. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> is that a retaining wall that you've put up, the stone wall? That was a retaining wall that was there. It's the backyard wall bordering okay. on Cathedral Oaks Road. We um, faced it with real stone. Ah. Uh. Okay. And the wall is five feet high, and that's why we're not allowed to go above five feet in the walls of our thing because of the HOA rules. Uh, curiously, the county, you know, uh, my, my, uh, when I built, was building my house, if I want to put up a steel fence, I can't be over six feet tall. But if it's uh -huh. a wood fence, it could be eight feet tall. So I have a wood fence. Are you in a HOA? No, no, oh, not bless at all. You. That's just the county's uh, the county's yeah. rules. Okay. So yeah, we're by Cathedral Oaks. I must have ridden my bike below your uh, property quite often. Yeah, I'm sure you did. And uh, you can see the hill with the uh, cell phone tower that looks like a water tank. And just to the left of that hill is Farrand Road. Oh, we go there often. Yeah. Once a month. Yeah. yeah. Mm hmm. You could probably get a pretty dark sky on that side over there where there's not much development. I yeah, say. there's um, from the um, slightly beyond north off to the right and down to where the ocean is on the left, which is um, northwest, southwest. Yeah, we have um, very dark skies um, with regard to light pollution, but we have a lot of fog. Or my big problem is fog and, and clouds and marine layer. And we street have, think. <laughs> while we're putting in the backyard, as you guys know here in Goleta, we had some probably two weeks of the best night skies I've experienced here in 25 years. They were just spectacular. Wow. wow. That email that I sent you where I was looking at the temperature of the night sky and whatnot, that was yeah. probably one of those nights because yes, it was it just inky was. black. Yeah. Very often when I look out at night, there's a very thin buttermilk cloud layer up there that mm -hmm. I, I, you know, ruins things. Today we had fog come in about um, 11 o'clock. It came up here just, just to our backyard and then it went back down to the left. So it's a Did it rain on you this afternoon? Yeah, yeah. Rain. We had a <laughs> quite a little storm for about 15 yeah. minutes. We had yeah. hail. Oh, yeah. I, I heard they had hail on the pass. Yeah. Hmm. And we didn't have any of that. How long did it last, Chuck? Oh, maybe 15 minutes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we had two storms came through. There was a real intense one, then it, the sun came out, then it came back again. Yeah. Is this That's your mount, Gary? I decided I was going to go to Home Depot when I got rained on. That is, that, that is my mount, yes. That's the big, that's, that's a big one. Why? Now, when I bought it about five or six years ago, it was uh, eleven thousand. Now it's thirteen thousand. 
inflation. Yeah. Do you have absolute encoders in that? Or? Oh, I don't. I don't. That's intended for um, people that operate remotely. Uh, and I go out and do all sorts of things, slip the clutches, move the scope by hand. Or it would right. confuse the hell out of uh, uh, absolute. Well, no, the absolute ones always know where they are. You know, my Orion, my Orion, you know, Atlas Pro has got that. I can loosen the clutches and move it all around, and it knows exactly where it is. Yeah. It doesn't lose anything. I just got on the wait list for a Mach 2, and it looks like they're finally producing it again. So maybe in a year, I'll get a call. Do you have, we don't have a, a Mach 2 and a Mach 4, do they have nowadays? No, no, there was a Mach 1, and now there's a Mach 2. Okay. Well, they used to make a 400 mount or something like that. Yeah, I, I have a 400 go to right okay. now. Okay. Yeah. Are you talking about astrophysics? Yeah. yeah. It's right there, a second from the right. Oh, oh, okay. And it's got absolute encoders. Yeah. Most of them, they make it so they're, they're retrofitable. You know, like on the 1100, it's retrofitable. So I'm going to get them right off the bat, but you know, mm -hmm. and you can get them retrofitted later. Yeah, I can add it if I want, if I want to pay another $8,000 or something. But I think it's fine. I've never used them before. Mm -hmm. I think the, the only thing you, you know, the, the absolute would be for is like uh, uh, using your scope without an auto guider and having it tracked properly. I would imagine. That, 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 that model track pretty well with, without it though really to tell you the truth it's it's a pretty good mount without yeah. as a matter of fact they've got some shots in there where they're showing 10 minute exposures uh i can't remember what scope they were using but i mean they weren't even guiding the thing and it was doing fine so what's karen trying to show here He's trying to show that it, it's harder to hold up a ball if you extend your arm out. Because it's not like the weight of the scope, it's the, it's the length of the arm on. The lever arm. Yeah. But of course, with a telescope, you're, you're balanced out, so it shouldn't matter, right? No. You have one arm on each side, they're balanced. It's still hard. Big refractors are harder than SCTs. I wish I could get notification to buy the doggone thing, but I got myself on the list. I know that, but. You know, I'm thinking there must be a market in list uh, position with astrophysics where you could sell list position futures or something. Uh. Yeah, they, they frown on that. If they hear you're doing that, they won't let you get on any future lists. Yeah, I've heard that. So what some of the is... some of the vendors that they sell to get on the list multiple times to get yeah. multiple copies, you know. And that's how so you this... keep the list, by the way, is you can go to somewhere like Astronomics and order it from them or OPT. Because they buy it in bunches, not based on how many people want to, they think they have customers, but they want to get a supply of them. Mm -hmm. If you find out that they're going to get some in a short while, you can get on their list. I've kind of kind of gone in the other direction. I'm, with this COVID thing, I have found going directly as if you can go directly to the manufacturer and then go through reseller because uh -huh. i had a bad experience on opt you know they they promised me a mount and they kept promising me and then it then they come on and they say well that guy doesn't work here anymore and the mounts out another year and so That's i just crazy. gave up on that and i went right, right directly to ap uh to order this mount and yeah if i gotta wait longer i will but at least i'm, I'm only going to pay for it when they're going to do the production run it's not when uh -huh. they they hold your money for a whole year. 
<laughs> and you don't get nothing. I think AP <laughs> was mad about that too. They heard some people were doing that and they got pissed off. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 can, I don't blame them. You know, it's not, it's not fair to the customer. No. And it ruins their reputation to Absolutely. some degree. Absolutely. So I just wish they gave you more feedback because, you know, you go and you sign up for the list and it's like, am I really on it or not? <laughs> you know, there's another thing about that, Chuck. When you call these guys, and this happened to me twice with these guys, and they go, oh, no, nope, you're not on the list. And what they're doing is they're looking at, they must be looking at a paper list instead of like a database or something like that. And you're looking at it to say, oh, I did, I was looking at the wrong list. <laughs> like, well, like, I had, a, I had, you know, I had a heart armor a couple of times with that one right there with those guys. <laughs> so, but anyway, yeah, we'll get there. Okay. Well, I'm going to, Sask, what about Sask give it up. Biz? All right. All right, Jerry. See you Bye -bye, guys Jerry. later. Bye. See you next week. Hi. Yes. Sex Monday. Yes. I just wanted to mention that Mike had that uh, review of the Radian 61 that that German guy did that showed it was just a, a knockoff telescope. And they're trying to uh, hype it all. That, that's quite a quite the review that the guy did. What's a, what it, are you talking about? It's a it's a Radian 61 that this guy said Trevor said that he d designed, and it turns out it's just really an OEM telescope, and it's kind of OPT oh. hypes every little bit of it. And charges, uh, you know, twice or three times what it's yeah. what you could buy it for somewhere else. Oh, OPT did that, huh? Wow, they did. Were they were part of the hype? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, uh, huh. I was trying to get. Oh, I gotta rings. go. I'll see you. Okay, bye. See you later, Jerry. I was trying to get some rings for my C14, and I went everywhere. I tried to get these rings. So finally, I got a hold of Parallax. And I got this guy, Joe Nastasi, I think is the guy's name. He's a really nice guy. And so we just went with email and, and gosh, I got these rings in probably about, I don't know, less than six weeks. It is less time than he said it was going to take to make these rings. So, uh, you know, it, and that's directly to the manufacturer. And they're beautiful. They're, they're, they're great. Do you think the rings make a, a bigger difference than having the... Uh things on the dovetails well i have the dovetails too but the issue here is i need to put the what i'm going to do is i'm going to have the c14 then on top of that i'm going to have an aiming station and i'm going to have the mp127 is in there and i'm going to use that as a combination imaging scope slash guide scope that's my my goal right there. So I kind of need to have the rings for that, if nothing else. But also for flexure, I'm thinking flexure. It might be, be it probably is better to have rings. Uh, and then so I'll have I'll have um, uh, Los Monday bars on both sides. I've got 19 inch Los Monday bars, so I'm gonna put putting on those both sides of the C14. That'll be a pretty good cradle for that thing. I think it'll. It'll cut down the flexure quite a bit. Okay, well, have right. fun, everybody. I'm going to ooze out of here. Yeah, it's See you guys. Call it. Thanks. You guys. Great to hear from everybody. See All you right. soon. Take care. Okay, bye -bye. thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.